afternoon. Uh, only moments ago, Scott Tomaszewski, age 32, a young man who lived in Rockville, Maryland his entire life, was sentenced by Judge John DeBilius to life without the possibility of parole for the murder of Richard Dick Villardo back on May 10, 2015. In addition to the sentence that was given of life without the possibility of parole for the murder of Mr. Villardo, the defendant was given an additional sentence of life imprisonment for the murder of Jody Villardo, and that sentence was consecutive to life without the possibility of parole sentence. Uh, I would, this case occurred on, on May the 10th, and for those who do not know the significance as we stand here today of May the 10th, it was Mother's Day. Uh, this murder was discovered uh, by Katie Villardo, Dick and Jody's daughter, who when their mom and dad didn't show up for a family meeting for Mother's Day, drove to the house uh, to discover a horrific uh, murder scene. Uh, she was very quickly joined by her sister-in-law, Lindsay and Andy, all of whom are with us here today. Uh, I want to commend them uh, for their courage and their, for their words today. Uh, I will tell you, if you were in the courtroom today, you heard a presentation uh, that uh, I did, did great honor to the memory of Dick and, and uh, Jody Villardo uh, by their son, their daughter, uh, Dick's sister, and, uh, and by uh, Lindsay, his daughter-in-law. Uh, I want to thank a number of people. There, look, I, I've been doing this about 35 years. I don't know that I've ever seen more letters written about uh, victims of a crime than I saw in this case. Uh, there were literally hundreds of letters writing about the friendships that go back literally decades. There are people here that, even as I left the courtroom, said I, I met Dick in kindergarten or I was in seventh grade with Jody. And there are business associates, neighbors, friends, they all speak glowingly of these wonderful people. Uh, this community was diminished by, by the vicious murder of these wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, this is a family lived with the motive that friends are family and family is everything. Uh, I think that uh, what you saw in the courtroom today was reflective of the motto that they live their lives by. I want to thank every one of those friends and family who came here to be with us today because I think it was your support and your letters that was a very important part of what happened in the courtroom today. Thank you to all of you that are here. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, this case, when it was discovered, was very much a red ball of who done it. Uh, the Montgomery County Police Department, uh, under Sergeant Larry Haley's uh, unit, uh, Fernando Carvajal, I know he is here with us, detectives are here. I will tell you to have a case that is as vicious as this, to be a complete whodunit on a Sunday, and five days later for them to be cuffing a suspect 3,000 miles away in Alaska with the cooperation of Alaskan authorities, the FBI, the United States Coast Guard. This was tremendous police work, and I think we all owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to the detectives that worked this case. Uh, and we also want to thank our, our partners both out in Alaska and our federal partners who helped us in the apprehension. Uh, look, I also want to thank uh, uh, Peter Larson and Michael Algio, who are my co-counsel in this case. We worked this case uh, passionately from the very beginning, and I will tell you that uh, everyone from the police through the, pr the prosecutor's office was deeply committed to making sure that this case was closed appropriately, and the man who was responsible for this crime was held uh, accountable. Um, I'm going to call now upon uh, Andy Villardo, uh, uh, Dick and Jody's son, uh, for a few comments. Andy. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, I really just want to get up here and thank everyone, all these faces that are beaming down on me here. There's no way that any one of our family could have done this without the love and support. You know, John references the letters that people wrote, but some of the, some of you sent them to us, and that literally fueled us day to day to know that we could, we had people that we could rely on. We felt all of your love. Thank you. Uh, we will never be able to thank you enough. And uh, the team, uh, just the state's attorney team, um, Peter and Michael and John, the, the work they did was unbelievable. Detective Carvajal and Sergeant Larry, ha Larry Haley in the Montgomery County uh, Police Department to track this monster across the country in a matter of days was pretty much like a movie. Uh, I thank Judge Debilius for performing his role and giving us all the justice that we were hoping that he would. And I feel personally a weight that's been lifted 
We have a long way to go. We have two incredible people that we miss every day that we just now can know that at least the monster that created this tragedy will never see the light of day. He will die in prison. And we will look forward to sharing memories and laughing and over beers and Christmas dinner and everything else that we have to look forward to. So thank you again. Okay, Chris Gordon with the first question, Channel 4. Chris. State's Attorney McCarthy, uh, you handle a lot of cases and you supervise a lot of cases, but this one you took personally and you handled it personally. Why? I, I think that uh, very early on we knew the vicious nature of the killings in this case. Uh, I knew there were multiple victims. Uh, the crime scene was horrific. Uh, I was there on the very first day. Uh, and this was a neighborhood that this type of crime was virtually unheard of. I knew there would be tremendous community interest in what was happening in this case. And so I, I took the case because I was deeply committed uh, to, to solving this crime and bringing the person responsible to justice. Are you satisfied? I'm absolutely satisfied. Look, I, the, bottom, the bottom line is under Maryland law, well, you do not have a death penalty. This is the maximum sentence that would be allowed by law. This was the best we could have possibly done. The sentence given by Judge Tabilius was dead on the right sentence. I thought his comments and many of the family members talked to me about it on the way down. They were gratified very much by the, by the tone and the quality of, of Judge Tabilius' comments. I think he hit the nail right on the head. Uh, and this was, look, the judge commented upon uh, the fact that as he looked down at this 32-year-old young man and he decided there was no hope for re rehabilitation for this man. That's basically what he said. There's no help of re rehabilitation. And I don't know that I could even look at you know, 50, 60, 70, I think he said even 80 years old, being free in the community and being assured that you would not do violence to another individual. That's a pretty chilling thought, uh, but I thought the judge's comments were right on the money. Well, let me, let me begin. You know, it, it's funny. Sometimes very simple things that can be done can solve a crime. Uh, I don't know how many people realize this or not, but we actually have a pawn unit in Montgomery County. We have people that are, work for the police department, and all they do is they look at the pawn records that are required by law to be kept to see who's pawning property in Montgomery County. Well, about a month prior to this murder, a woman by the name of Eve Dempster, who lived across the street, and she was here with us today in court. I don't know if Ms. Dempster is still with us. Uh, her house was broken into. As it turns out, it was broken into by the same individual, Scott Tomaszewski. How do we know that? Because we have a videotape of Scott Tomaszewski about two blocks from here in a pawn shop bringing in the fruits of the burglary of Ms. Dempster's house to be pawned. What happened was the pawn unit, at the request of Sergeant Haley, checked Scott's name against the pawn records. And when we, it was, you know, look, this was a hunch. I guess this is a police hunch. It's, it's, it's not terribly sexy, but looking at pawn records solved this murder because right away we knew, wait a minute, this guy lives next door. He burglarized the lady across the, store, the, across the street. This was a burglary. Is that the same guy we're looking at? That was what broke this case. Subsequently, we found out that Mr. Tomaszewski, literally within probably about an hour and a half of this murder, was on his way to Dulles Airport to fly on a prearranged cruise with his parents uh, out to Alaska and to the West Coast. So within hours of having committed this murder, he was thousands of miles away in the company of his parents, who did not know anything about the fact that he had been involved in this crime. Uh, but it was about, I'd say, three or four days, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. This was a red ball who done it. The pawn record hit comes on Wednesday, and then we pretty much, over the next 48 hours, put this case together. We coordinate with the FBI, the Alaskan State Police, the Juneau uh, Police. We coordinate, we, we get airline flights for uh, officers. I know that Fernando Carverhall was among the officers that flew out to Alaska initially to go out there to interrogate uh, Mr. Tomaszewski when he was taken into custody. And when he was arrested, by the way, the initial arrest was for the burglary. The initial arrest was not for the murder, it was for the burglary, and in the course of the interview on the burglary, they transitioned to, to the conversation about the murder. He made admissions about the murder, and then he was subsequently charged with the murder as well. Kevin Lewis with ABC7. Kevin, those that were in the courtroom, 
how would you describe Scott Tomaszewski's level of remorse, his demeanor? I noticed he was slouched in the chair for most of the entire sentence. Look, I, I said this in open court, Kevin. I, I don't think that anybody would look at the physical demeanor of this young man in court and see that there was any an ounce of remorse. Uh, he submitted a letter to the court today, uh, which called into question a, a series of medical examinations that had been done by him by some really outstanding psychiatrists and psychologists uh, who, who he, he found, because basically, basically they said, you are not crazy, you are, there is no medical explanation, basically what you did was an, a monstrous act, what you did was evil, and I cannot be of assistance to the defense team in, in the presentation of, of your case in court. That's what they said. He disagreed with a series of experts. Uh, he did not seem to be engaged, uh, did not appear to have any facial expression. I thought he was flat in his affect. Uh, and the only thing he talked about with any level of passion whatsoever was his mother uh, during the, his comments. But other than that, I think he showed no, no consideration for the Velardo family. And look, th this family knew this. You know, again, you're talking about a murder that was perpetrated by someone who had been the neighbors. Andy played with this kid. They, 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 you know, they, they pick up football. I think Katie was in some of those football games too, as, as, as she, she knew this kid. I mean, this, this was a neighbor who came into the house, knew that house, knew every stitch of that house, uh, and, and, and it came in there pre-armed. This was, look, this was not a, bur by the way, this was not a burglary gone bad. This was not a burglary gone bad. This was not somebody in a home invasion robbery going into an occupied house. Dick Villardo was in his bed, he was in his night clothes, he was sleeping. He and his wife jo Jody had only moments before come home from an outing with the garden club from their neighborhood. They were asleep. Dick was attacked in his bed. The physical evidence irrefutably shows that. I think Mr. Tomaszewski, he came armed with what effectively was a machete, another knife, wearing gloves, masked, and went right at Dick. This was a premeditated, execution of a man who was helpless sleeping in his bed. That's what this case was about. And the injuries and what Katie had to see and what Andy had to see and what Lindsay had to see was absolutely horrific. Horrific. All right, we got Megan Cordy with WTOP. John, can you talk about the fact that this was a plea deal, but then there was no ownership of the crime? And the judge speaking to that, he said it wasn't something that happened, it was something that you did. I thought that was an interesting point. Can you talk about well, that? Well, Look, I think acceptance of responsibility for a crime is very important, especially if you're looking to see whether or not somebody can be rehabilitated. I think any judge is going to look to, is this person accepting responsibility? Once you have a person who could do this, not accept responsibility, why would you harbor any hope that this person who has yet to accept any responsibility, for, real, real responsibility for the crime, would be re rehabilitatable? And I think that was... I think that's what Judge DeBilius was talking about. I don't have any hope that I can rehabilitate you because I'm not hearing from you that you're actually even really taking responsibility for the crime that you actually committed. Okay. I think that's it. Anybody else with further questions? We're trying to wrap up. One more question we have. Uh, Michelle Tigona again with the Crime Lab okay. You, you know what? If Katie's willing to do this, I'm going to ask Katie. I'm going to ask Katie to answer that question. All right? Okay. Like, oh darn. Um, so I'm Katie Villardo, and yeah, I was the one that found my parents. And I think the resounding thing we wanted to get across today in court was that my parents were not what happened to them. My parents were fabulous people, unbelievable parents pillars of this community, successful in business because of their own efforts and actions, um, a friend to anyone that would come across their path. Um, you know, my mother was a two-time breast cancer survivor. My father hid many of his little ailments from people because he didn't want people to worry about him. Um, they were just the type of people that our friends, some of our friends that are here from our childhood, they grew up in our house too. Um, unfortunately, they grew up knowing the person who committed this crime as well. My parents, Judge Dubelius touched on, you know, that he thought my parents maybe had possessed the character to forgive. And 
I can't even go there because the thought that someone could actively take the lives of two people and not recognize that the amount of love that existed there and the love that they would have given to him if he was so willing to accept it is just a really sad situation to me. And I, I don't know that forgiveness is something I need to worry about because justice has been found and he is never going to walk again. And I know that that's the best we can do for mom and dad. Thank you. So, thanks. Thanks. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.